here's what needs to be seen among men. It isn't your self-righteousness. It isn't your power and authority. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm got the sword and I'm coming in. Or whatever it may be. It's, it's gentleness. Let your gentleness be seen among all men. The, the character of the church needs to be a place of joy and then gentleness. So we're tender when someone is hurting and, and maybe you came in even tonight, you're hurting, broken, or some sadness in life or whatever. It takes gentleness to be able to be sensitive to that and lift others up out of that. And the world is looking for a gentle, safe, firm foundation which is meant to be the body of Christ. Gentleness itself is a fruit of the Spirit. So if you have your name written in the book of life, you've asked Christ in your life, well, well then you've been filled with the Spirit of God. In Ephesians, uh, in Galatians chapter five, verse 23, right? Gentleness, self-control, against such there's no, there's no law. Gentleness is a byproduct of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Only you know if you're gentle at home. Only knew, you know if you're gentle with your family. Well, your family knows too. Your kids know, your friends know. Friends know if everything that comes off your lif- lips are harsh. Um, you know, we're, we're quick with, I mean, I, listen, I laugh at good sarcasm. If it's, if it's good sarcasm, it's, it's, it can be really funny if it's light and playful. But the word sarcasm means the ripping and tearing of flesh. It's a used that, uh, literally a medical term used for the tearing away of the flesh that a wild boar would do with its kill. <laughs> tearing. That's where we get the word sarcasm. And it is, if you think about it, joke-wise, it's like, I'm just gonna dig at you. Oh man, that shirt doesn't make you look very fat. I, it does too. Anyway, so it's, the, sarcasm, we're, we're, we have to be careful, is there a gentleness that's coming from who we are? Um, I realize that you guys in Truckee don't know me, so it's okay to laugh at me during this, it really it truly is, it's, all, it's fine. Most of them do, so don't, don't, don't worry about that. But, but that gentleness needs to be coming in, not these other things, these no, our puffed up knowledge or our own power. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Jesus said, take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It's a characteristic of our king. And he says, I'd like you to just come under the yoke that I have, you know, the ancient beast that would carry the yoke to pull through the, the, the fields. Uh, they'd use a larger beast, a stronger beast that was, that was stayed and had done it for years and years so that the younger beast could know how to walk. And he goes, come on in and take the yoke and let me lead you because I'm gentle, peaceful, loving, and I'm gonna give you a direction that the world needs to see in us. And so that's that gentleness. Verse four six and seven, and you hopefully know this. Um, it's a pretty famous portion of scripture, but be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Um, hopefully you've heard that scripture before. It's pretty, used all the time. We use it all the time. Be anxious for nothing, man. It's really a bummer when, because here's the deal. Once you're a Christian, it's, there's no more anxiety. I know I just go through every single day without a bit of anxious. <laughs> See, anxiety is something that, in fact, in these last seasons, we've felt in higher levels than ever. We've, we, we've experienced a different type of, of, of tension and, and uh, you know, things feel un, unsettled in the world and so there is an anxiety. Isn't it powerful that Paul, chained to a guard, end of his life, says really, there really isn't a need or a reason for us to be anxious. Remember, we're written in the book of life. Remember, we'll be transformed, right? Conformed and transformed to our God in that glorious eternal hope that's ahead. Those truths, truly digested in our hearts, start dispelling anxiety. Because we realize that the things we're anxious of are temporary. We're anxious of this next season and whether this will happen or that'll happen, or I'll get through this. Forgetting that God is sovereign, God gets us through to where we're going. He is in charge and we forget to get our eyes on the one in charge of the journey. So so here, Paul draws it in and I love that it's a guy going through a radical, he had every reason to have anxiety, right? And David himself would cry that out. In Psalm 139 at the end, he'd go, oh, search me and know my every anxious thought and try me and see if there's any wickedness within me. He would cry out before God. And so, so anxiousness is not something that is, you know, just, it doesn't mean you're weak, it just means it's, it's a common element in the world. But 
when we examine it, we're having that anxious heart and we know where we're standing, we're leaning towards the kingdom, all of a sudden, those things that have been feeling like so big a tidal wave disappear. Because the worst that can happen is today's your last day on planet Earth. And actually, the worst thing that could happen, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But if you do know him, and today's your last day on Earth, I mean, we've been celebrating a, a Coach O this last couple weeks, just, he went home, boom, in a moment last week. Just boom, before the king right before the king, um, our, our trials end in heaven. Anxious is a, is a weird word, right? Worry, it means being literally being pulled in many directions. It also has with it the idea of being strangled. And so in the anxiety, and when you, when you hear today how people are feeling about the world, uh, that's often a word I feel, so, I'm so anxious about everything that's going on. It's kind of like being strangled. I remembered a moment with my son when he was little, we were living in Vail, and I was trying to stuff him into his snowsuit, and I've used this analogy a couple times. He was just a little squirt, and I'm putting him in it, and he had this look on his face like something was really wrong, and I'm like, dude, we're going to play, we're going to play, and like his leg was bent back like this, and I'm trying to jam it into one of the leg holes, you know, and then all of a sudden I realized, oh, oh I'm, so, I'm about to break, break his arm off the back. Sorry, buddy, I'm sorry, but I got it in right, and he's like, Okay, that's anxiety, right? Things are not working right, Dad. The look on his, on his face, and the world kind of feels that way a little bit in moving forward in here. But he says, he here's how it's dispelled. Prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. So the idea of prayer is this, this powerful adoration, this um, seeing God's greatness and acknowledging it. So when you do that in prayer, God, you are king. You're my shelter. You're my hope. It reminds us of where we're standing. It reminds us of the hope that's ahead, the kingdom, right? So that starts dispelling anxiety because we know we're, we stand on a firm in truth and in hope, right? Then, then the idea of supplication is this, um, this idea of uh, earnest sharing. It's the um, making a request. It's interesting how we do a lot of our earnest sharing with people instead of first with God. We have a problem. We're worried about it, and it is good to get good counsel. There's nothing wrong with good counsel, but, but we often just sort of vent all our anxieties on people instead of going in and saying, Lord, first I pray to you, I acknowledge and adore you above all things, and then I give all my supplication before him first. Help me in this, I'm confused, I'm frightened. I, I do feel the anxieties of the world right now, help me, right? So there's this idea that Paul says, go to him in prayer, Break loose, make your requests before him, this earnest sharing and, 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 and uh, crying out to him. Remember Matthew 7, verse seven. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. If anyone asks, he receives and he who seeks finds and he who knocks, the door will be open. And then the final ingredient, which tends to be a missed often ingredient for victory is thanksgiving. So we adore him we supplicate or we say, God, here's what's happening in my life, and we go, and thank you for writing me in your book. Thank you that you are coming again soon. Thank you that heaven is sealed for me and my family, my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Gratitude, rejoicing, brings victory over those things like, such as anxiety. He goes, let your requests be made known to God, and then, verse seven, the peace of God, which surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we want some sort of peace and all of us have come up with a narrative that says this is where I'll find peace. It's in this, it's in this drug or it's in this thing I do or this relationship I have or this career I'll take place. We think about and try to figure out what peace is and Paul says guys, nothing in this planet compares to your soul feeling the peace of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. Nothing compares to it. So stop looking around. This piece surpasses your tiny little brain, your little gray matter that you have. It just doesn't even come close because there's a confidence and a, and a reoccurring um, uh, comfort that comes by the Spirit of God that says, oh, you belong to me, God says. Oh, you're mine. You've been set apart for my purposes. And so it says it passes all understanding. See, it's, it's the peace of God that guards and it's the God of peace that guides. Music